We're going to begin with prayer. Okay. Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the Sabbath hours, the time in which we have to fellowship with you, and the time that we have uh, to share and study together. Lord, we are thankful for each person who's been participating in these studies, trying to understand your word. And uh, we just ask, Lord, this evening that as we, we look at some issues that have arisen in this movement, uh, that we can understand them. Um, help us to study together through your Spirit's teaching and leading. Help us to be submissive to you. And uh, Lord, we pray for each person, our particular struggles that we have in this life. I pray, Lord, that this study uh, can be a peaceful study, one that um, we can feel your presence. And we just ask this and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, so, uh, good evening, everyone. Happy Sabbath. And uh, we're going to look at um, my, my initial plan, usually for the Friday night study, is to look at some issues in Ezekiel or ideas or concepts or light that has been brought to us as we've studied the book of Ezekiel. Um, but the last couple of days, some, some discussions arose on the alpha chat on um, WhatsApp that, that I want to address. And, and it's, it's not just what has been talked about, it's how we talk about things and how we deal with these types of controversies. So first thing I'll do is, is share the screen that I have here, of WhatsApp, and there we go. So everybody should see that. Now I'm going to uh, change this a bit. <clears throat> so this uh, question was asked a little bit earlier, like uh, probably a day or so before on WhatsApp. And so this is back on Wednesday or something like that. And he had said that we had no, he, he, this person stated that they had no clear light on why 151 was chosen. And, and so I said, what do you mean you have no clear light on why 151 was chosen? So uh, we're going we're gonna to address this. I'm just going to look at his response here. He says exactly no clear light to why the 150 was chosen. Possible combinations for the scattering are 126, 151, 252, 1260, and 2520. And only one fell in our life since one was passed. So I would think he's saying the one fell in our life is the 126. Um, and the one that was passed was the 2520. The idea that the 151 was applied only makes sense to me in a best fit manner. For the 126, how it was applied was after the fact. It was not in any way designed to elicit ap apocalyptic fever. And its commencement point is logical because of the actions of James and others. But the start date of 151 was designed to fall in a time period when we are still alive. It's really hard to see why the date to start the prophetic period was chosen. 1863 and 1989 have a relationship. After the fact, clear pal palatable reasons can be given for them and the church can truly say amen. While I'm not sure of the true architect of the dates, let me keep digging. Maybe I will find something. So I'm not necessarily sure what he means in some of his sentences. Some may just be awkward English. Um, but I, I'm going to write and explain what this is. And I have to change screens here for myself for the recording. <clears throat> So we know that we have these two 2520s. Um, so this is the prophetic mirror. I'm going to draw this all here. And we know we have 742 
and we have 1863. Now I'm not going to really worry about the 2520s in between here. But we know this is a period of 2,604 years. And the 126 comes from Daniel chapter, uh, chapter 5 with Belshazzar. And we had the meanie, meanie, tekel, you farson. So a meanie, meanie, tekel, you farson. And this was the way that we understood this was a meanie is 50, oops, 50 shekels, and a tekel is one shekel, and a eupharsin is half of a meanie. And we added those up together and we got 126 shekels. And we know there's 20 uh, giras to a shekel. And so 126 times 20 equals 2520. So this was understood for quite a while in the message. Now, 1989 being the time of the end, we had recognized that this was a period of 126 years. And this is a symbol of the scattering. Now, we also noted, at least some people did, that if we go back um, 126 years from 742, we don't end up on a year that any significant event occurs. Now, some people did put a significant event, but they were using a chronology that was faulty, and it wasn't really connected in my mind. But I just mentioning that because what ended up happening in 2012 is that Parminder looked at the date 1888, which is the rejection of the third angel's message, and he counted 126 shekels, and he came to the year 2014. I'll put it underneath so we're just consistent. B.C. No, these are A.D. These are not B.C. dates. This one's a B.C. date. This is an A.D. date. So this is in our time. 2014 B.C., well, six years ago. And in 2012, Parmander made a prediction that this would be the Sunday law. Now, in, in making that prediction, we obviously rejected that idea. One is there was no basis by connecting this to 1888, because in 1888, there isn't a Sunday law. And also, we saw this as time setting, and we rejected time setting. Now, we know over time that this ended up being accepted, but not exactly in the way that it was taught. Now, Another point that arose, and exactly when it, when it arose or when this argument was noticed by Parminder, I'm not sure. He told me that originally he figured it back in 2012, but I don't necessarily trust him. But in Ezekiel chapter 52, so it's in Ezekiel 52, and the verse is... Somebody, I think it's in 52. No, it's not Ezekiel. It's Jeremiah 52, pardon me. Or no, Jer no, it's not Jeremiah. It's in Ezekiel, but it's not 52. Um, I don't know what I'm thinking. I was thinking of Jeremiah 52, but that's a totally different thing. Um, I should have had this. It's Ezekiel 45, 12. That's where it is. Um, and uh, this verse says, The shekels shall, shall be 20 geras, 20 shekels plus 25 shekels plus 15 shekels shall be your mina or your, uh, that's your mana. Depends on how you spell that. Now, so in Ezekiel 45, 12, It tells us that a, uh, it's one of the verses that tells us there's 20 geras to a shekel. So it's going to say uh, 20 geras equal one shekel. 
but it's also going to tell us that a mana or a mini or a mana, uh, mina, there's different ways it's spelled, is going to be 25, 20, and 15, which would be 60. So we know that there was a mana of 60 shekels. Now, a tekel is a shekel here. And so if you applied this to 60, you would end up with 151 instead of 126. And the interesting point was that when you went from 1863 to 2014, it was 151 years. Now, I only first heard about this um, probably in 2018, maybe 2017, that I'd heard of that argument. Not exactly sure when that came about. But there was this validation then, at least of this date of 2014, by having a second witness. But we know that this wasn't a Sunday law. Now, there was this argument made that 2014 was a Sunday law, which... In, in making that argument, the way that this was done is it was simply taking our line of the priests, and hopefully you can see this a bit, um, taking the line of the priests and going from 9-11 and looking at uh, this is midnight, this is midnight cry, and this is the Sunday law, but the Sunday law in this line even though it's the Sunday law on the big line, is the close of probation. And this is the line of the priests. And the suggestion was that this is 2014, the midnight cry is 2018, and then the close of probation would be 2019, in November 9th. So this was uh, the argument that was made. And so, in looking at this line, or are the cats barking? Are the cats barking? Um, somebody's got a mic on. That we hear dogs barking. I'm not sure who that is. It's not cats barking. Um, it's not here anyway. So um, when we when we look at this line here, the way that that uh, Parminder tried to address this is he said that this was April 19th, and this was July 21st, and this was August 15th, and this is October 22nd in 1844. So this is all 1844. And so he suggested that 2014 was midnight, but then he says that midnight is a symbol of the Sunday law. And that July 21st, 2014 is a Sunday law. Now, that's not really, I mean, I can understand it being midnight if you took 2014 and said it's midnight. But we can't say that it's a Sunday law because we don't have a Sunday law in 1844. So this, this wasn't really logical, but this is the way that it was done. This is the argument that he tried to make. Now, I tried, I accepted what Parminder said, even though I didn't think it was logical. And I tried to bring this up to Jeff in his study. And I tried to say, we can put the Sunday law here because the way that they did this, the way Parminder did this, I guess I need to explain it further, is he looked at the big line, the big line, this is the close of probation. This is the loud cry. And this is the Sunday law, right? So this is the big line. And he's saying that this line is representing the big line. And that's why this is a Sunday law. So maybe I should have explained that point. I kind of skipped it. The point being that 2014 is not a Sunday law. Just because we can line these up in this way with the close of probation doesn't mean that we have to see this as a Sunday law. Because it's a Sunday law that is in our big line. The Sunday law is the way mark that would parallel midnight, but it doesn't mean that midnight has to be a Sunday law. And it doesn't mean that 2014 has to be a Sunday law. Just because in this way mark, we have a Sunday law at midnight, doesn't mean at every midnight you have a Sunday law. 
But that was the argument that he was using, which is a faulty argument. Now, I just want to go back here to look at this. So this argument of these 151 years, this is just merely a second witness to 2014. That is, we have these 126, time 1888 and 2014. But the 150 years, 51 years, is going to tie 1863 to 2014. And that means uh, the end here in 2014 is going to be typified by the beginning in 1863. And in 1863, what happened in 1863? That's a broad question. But in, in regard to the 2520 and the scattering, what happened? Rejection of the 2520 for one. Okay, so it's a rejection of the 2520. And it's also the 1863 chart. And what is the 1863 chart? It's a rejection of the 1843 and 1850 charts. Okay, it is. It's an image of jealousy. All right. It's also the rebuilding of um, Jericho, right? That's understood by agreed. people. That's agreed. Rebuilding of Jericho. And, and the prophecy of the rebuilding of Jericho typifies what happens here in 1863 from 1860 to 1863 with James and Ellen White's children. So the yeah. fourth Seventh-day Adventist church, their oldest and their youngest son die, just as the prophecy of the rebuilding of Jericho talks about. So wow. um, I'm not going to go into that, Mark, but they do die. Uh, one of them, the oldest son, he lies on, on the material for the 1863 charts, and he gets pneumonia, and he dies. So there's a rejection of, of the 2520 that happens in 1863. Now, when we go to 2014, we have, a, within this movement, we have a rejection of a message. And, and what is rejected in 2014 that would parallel 1863? Joel? Okay, so when we look at it, we look at the message of Joel. But that's really not the issue. In 2014, something else is happening. And it, it's, it's more than just this issue of Joel. One is we have chronology introduced into the message. Now, it doesn't mean we never had chronology before, but we have chronology in a very specific way um, that is we, we have an affirmation of the 2520, but we also have this whole chronological structure that is the basis for the July 18, 2020 prediction. Without this, July 18, 2020 never can happen. And when chronology was presented uh, to this movement, it was rejected. Now it wasn't rejected by Jeff, but it was rejected by many, many people. And when, from my perspective, because I'm the one who introduced this chronology, I saw that this chronology was consistently attacked. It was attacked by the people who left the movement. Now, I also did introduce material in 2013. So material was introduced in 2013. It wasn't specifically the chronology. It was my study on the 2520 and the... And the a prophetic mirror and people in the movement who who ended up leaving the movement rejected that understanding of the 2520 and it was manifest in 2014 the issue on the on the outside was joel now if you go to 1888 we also have a rejection of the third angel's message here what was the issue in 1888 anybody no, know no. book of galatians okay it was the book of galatians but it wasn't really about the book of galatians it was really about the nature of christ if you read um uh, butler's book on galatians and a.t jones response to that book what you will find is that the real issue for butler was the idea that Christ saw himself as a sinner. 
uh, Butler did not accept the idea that Jesus felt as a sinner, except on the cross. And A.T. Jones says, well, if Christ can be feel as a sinner at one time of it in his life, there's no reason that he can't feel as a sinner as another time in his life. Now, A.T. Jones' argument on the nature of Christ is that Jesus took a nature that felt the guilt, the condemnation, and the curse of sin his whole lifetime. On the cross, he was now being treated as a sinner by God, but he felt that experience of what it's like to be a sinner his entire life. And so this is something that uh, Jones and Wagner make very clear, especially Jones. So in 1888, Butler is arguing against this idea. Now, it's manifest as an issue over the law in Galatians. That becomes the, the battleground, so to speak. Instead of attacking it directly, it's attacked indirectly over this other issue. And, and the reason why people do that, why they attack something in an indirect way, is if they attacked it directly, it would be seen for what it is. Now, if we look at Joel, we can see that Joel was an issue that was uh, brought up, but the real issue had to do with what was happening in, in the movement. And so these things were what, we, what I would call distractions. They were uh, distractions from what really was happening. And uh, what the, every time light came to this movement, one of these distractions would arise. Now, I'm going to go back to sharing the screen here. Yes, um, could you check from outside what is going on? What's going on in the movement? Yes, it is um, outside making the sense, sunset down. Oh. Oh, sunsets right now, so it's starting the Sabbath. And yeah, um, it is so terrible, bright orange and bright yellow and yeah. white blue. Yeah, and the moon would be rising after the sun sets. Okay, but that's a whole other topic. But thanks, Mark. Okay. Okay, so. What he says here in this, about the 151 years, uh, he says 1863 and 18, 1989 have a relationship after the fact. So his idea is that we have this 1989 and he accepts that, but he doesn't accept uh, 2014. So I give him a response. I explain what I just explained. I have there Ezekiel 45. And um, now he says, in uh, in here, one of the things he said, it was not in any way designed to elicit apocalyptic fever. Now, I knew then that there's something underlying his thinking. And this is, this is one of the things I want to address. I'm not just addressing the, the issues that are brought up, but I'm addressing how we communicate. So I always try to be as clear as I can. If I think something, I'm not going to hide what I think. Uh, doesn't mean I'm going to be uh, really mean about something or really brash or brazen in how I present something. Uh, but I'm going to be very clear on what I think about an issue. I'm not going to attack an issue uh, indirectly. Uh, to me, that is a kind of a deceitful way of, of presenting truth. Because I believe that we need to be as open as the day and that truth always bears examination. And that if I'm going to present something, I want to be clear what it is I'm saying. I don't want to have anything hidden about what I'm saying. Um, now, when I'm, I'm sharing something with somebody who maybe isn't, isn't an Adventist, doesn't understand certain truths, doesn't mean I dump everything on them all at once. I want to know what they understand about things. And I do want to lead them to a logical conclusion as they study something. But um, it doesn't mean that I'm deceitful in how I present things. So 
I believe there's a prophetic significance of what occurred in 2014. So when we, when we had this 2014 once again introduced, I know at least in 2017 it was introduced into the message. Um, I then accepted 2014 as, as a way mark. Though I wasn't sure how to interpret it. Now we know in 2017 we also had uh, suggestions on how to interpret it and one was this idea of sunset. And I don't think it was completely wrong. I think there actually is a way in which that could be applied. But Parminder was extremely opposed to that idea. Now, he says, you know, about this apocalyptic fever. I said, I do not see any apocalyptic fever in marking 2014. Are you suggesting that there was? So, to me, if you're dealing with 2014, uh, there was no apocalyptic fever about 2014, because one is initially in 2012, it was rejected. So nobody was interested in 2014 after 2012. And then it wasn't until three years after 2014 that we then had, uh, had this introduced again. So again, it would be after the fact that we now examine this. So one of his arguments is the 126 um, is after the fact but that the 151 is predictive. Well, it might've been in 2012, but it sure wasn't predictive in 2017. So I think this is something that um, he doesn't really address. Now I also have the fact that the 151 years prior to the start of the prophetic mirror is marked, but not the 150, but not the, I should say not the 126. Uh, 893 BC is the year that Jehoram begins his reign marking the end of Jehoshaphat's reign. So I'm, I'm gonna go back here and look at this. Um, now part of this is, I always wanted to have something here. So in 893 BC, we have the end of Jehoshaphat's reign. And the beginning of Jehoram's reign. Now, Jehoram is, is, these are in Judah, but this is in the time of Ahab. And to me, there had to be this connection at the prophetic mirror at the beginning that is going to match something at the end. And since we didn't have anything in the 126, because if we look at this, this is part of the extension of the prophetic mirror, but it's really this part of it that's important. We don't have to have the 126s um, at the beginning. It's the 151 that we need at the beginning. So this ties us to this history of Ahab, and this ties us to 2014. Now, I'm not going to go into all the details in studying this history, but this has been well documented by Jeff, and, and that this connects with this history, because this is going to be about, in this message, uh, the true priests and the false priests. That's the issue that's going to be manifested. And it begins in 2014. In 2014, we don't even realize that we have a line of the priests. That is, we don't, we don't know who we are yet. Uh, we have some, some inkling about it, but uh, not much that's really going to help us uh, to understand 2014. So, in 2014, we don't know enough. And we don't know enough in 2012 when that prediction about a Sunday law is being made. So here we have somebody running with a message uh, when they really don't have a message to give. And, but it is the person who gave that message, Parminder, who ends up really being uh, the leader in rebellion that happens as this, uh, begins in 2014. First, he predicts a date as 2014, the year, and then he uses his time setting later on. But that rebellion that he manifests had begun in 2014. So in a sense, he predicts his own rebellion. Now, I don't want this to be just about me uh, showing where somebody is wrong. And and I've tried to think how to approach this. So first off, 
do people understand this argument for people who have seen the alpha the alpha chat did they un or, or just read it now did they, does anybody understand his argument about the 151 cuz at this point i didn't understand why he would have problems with it and and he's also what's that okay if if i'm understanding part of where he was coming from it's more that he was seeing the one that the 151 was not something that had ever been called out by Ellen White, nor could he come back to something dealing with 151 from scripture. He is trying to set aside uh, anything having to do with a, a chronological event. Right. So, so that's, and, and he's taking something. So he's attacking July 18th, ultimately, as you're going to find out. Right. He doesn't come and attack July 18th directly. He sort of, you know, picks at flaws of other chronological issues. But his argument isn't really logical, um, it, at least in my mind. Now, he can say, well, there is no 151 in Scripture, but there is in Daniel chapter 5, because we can take it as a manna being 60 shekels. So we have that. Um, but also we have the prophetic mirror that can tie that history at the beginning to the history at the end. So he's going to say here, the third angel's message arrived in 1844, and with reform line logic, 1850 marks its empowerment, and 1863 concludes that history. Um, so he's going to use this, this sort of way mark, 1798, 1842, 1844, 1850, 1863. Now, I'm not sure I would have looked at uh, 1863 as the end of, of the history of the third angel's message because 1888 is the end, not 1863. So even from his own argument here, third angel message arrives in 1844. It doesn't conclude in 1863. That's just a rejection, rejection of the first angel's message, not a rejection of the third. So he does talk about the rejection of the third. Um, he says, eight, so I don't understand this statement. So maybe somebody can help me. He says, 1888 is a springboard with the terminus in 2014 linkage by rejection of the third angel in one history presents many problems. So it's obviously not a good sentence. More about them later. So what, what does he mean by this? 1888 is the springboard with the terminus in 2014 by rejection of the third angel. I, I don't even know what 2014 has to do with the rejection of the third angel's message. That's not actually the history that we're addressing in 2014. Um, I think he's trying to apply the 126 from 1888 to 2014 as being one being the beginning, one being the ending of an era that was rejecting the third angel's message. And see, I don't see that that's why we chose 1888. I mean, it is the rejection of the third angel's message. We didn't choose 1888. Well, well, we didn't choose it, you're saying? Right. Yeah. Uh, right. 1888 becomes this way mark that we can count 126 years to 2014. But I would say that what, what Parminder was doing that was logical is we had 1863 conclude in 1989 and it was logical to take 1888 and connect it into the future with the same 126 years um it was logical the problem was is it was time setting so but also we didn't understand enough to even make such a prediction that is in 2012 we didn't understand what we were doing because we didn't have the line of the priests. Now we can look back and we can apply it to the line of the priests, but we didn't have that knowledge in 2012. And what Satan will often do is he will use a partial truth to, to weaken um, its relationship to other truths 
by mixing that that truth with error so it's a partial truth and to me it's it's quite clear that god led in all of this in spite of the enemy's attempt to destroy this movement and, and what we've seen here what this is all about is the enemy's all about the enemy is the to destroy this movement does somebody have a comment yeah i do okay okay the the issue that i'm having and i'm going to go back to an a comment you made just a few minutes ago okay 1863 was the reestablishment of jericho right the rebuilding of jericho okay so in other words in 1863, the Seventh-day Adventist corporate church chose not to be the direct organization that God had envisioned them to become, that he wanted them to become, right. because they became more Jericho and have continued to descend more into idolatry. Right. Now, the, 100, the 126 year antithesis taking us to 1989 brings us to a point of a movement that begins that is going to set aside what those in 1863 refused to accept. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so with 1888. Okay, with 1888, we have a progression of, of 25 years down the line from 1863 yeah. because they did not wish to accept the clarity on the third angel's message. Mm -hmm. And 21 years after that, by 1909, they had rejected pretty much everything that the pioneers in 1844 had believed. Right. So the logic that I'm having is I'm what what I'm trying to, to address is 1863 is the antithesis of 1989. Well, it's definitely the completion of something that began in 1863. Now, when, when it comes to 1888, where, where Parminder tried to connect it, is he was connecting it to the Sunday law. But of course, there was no Sunday law in 1888. And what we did later is we said, well, it has something to do with the rejection of the third angel's message that we tied it to 2014. But to me, the real issue is that the crisis that existed in Adventism in 1888 typifies the crisis that began in this movement in 2014. That's where the parallel lies. Not in all these other things dealing with the church, because I don't take that 2014 has anything to do with Adventism. Now, when you do that, you, you come into line with my suggestion that I've suggested for a long time, is that the line of the priest is the typical line that it's not the big line and that we can't have time setting in the big line we could only have time setting in the line of the priest itself and my argument was i didn't know whether we could predict external events or not all i knew is that we could look at our line and we could see the structure of time but we were in a typical line and the question is could we then apply that to any of these other events that are worldwide events. And I think that we can't. Now that we've seen July 18, 2020 pass, I'm convinced that my initial idea was correct, that the line of the priest is typical, that it's not a real line, and that the close of probation that we talked about in November 9th is not anything but a typical close of probation. It's not Daniel 12, 1, and it's not let him that be righteous be righteous still. So, in, in looking at this, I understand that people had problems because Parminder introduced 2014 after the fact. 
but even then his interpretation of it didn't really make sense, at least for what we experienced in 2014. Because what we experienced in 2014 in this movement can't be described as a Sunday law. It wasn't the Sunday law crisis. It was a crisis over an understanding of the message. That's the way that I took 2014. So he's going to go through this, um, you know, through this logic. So he's, so I'll read what he says here. My example noted the relationship between 1863 and 1989 as seamless integration. First, all marked with solid four generation logic. In it, you see Miller's dreams, finding fulfillment in the raising of a jewel handler at the conclusion. It's there and easy to see with the 1863 springboard and the terminus in 1989. Now, 1888 and 2014 has to have a better theory to stitch the period. While I'm a big believer in time in every generation, I will not accept arbitrary use of, usage of number in our history. Is there 151? Yes, there is. Is its usage justified in our history? Yes. Has it been used correctly so far? The answer is no. We see it with Nashville Blunder and others by our former brethren. So when he addresses this, he now argues that there's 151 years, but I don't even know what he's talking about. Because if he's rejecting the 151 that we have, does anybody know what he's talking about? The way that he worded this, I would have difficulty with it. I, I can't <laughs> say that, yes, I understand where he's coming from. Yeah, yeah, I don't know where he's coming from. And he's not telling me, right? And, but then what he does is he introduces what he calls the Nashville blunder. Now, so he's, he's now moved to July 18, 2020. That's where the discussion is going to, to shift to. And, you know, and, and And, you know, he answers my thing that he wasn't suggesting that, um, I don't know what you mean that I'm suggesting that it was apocalyptic fever. If you've been part of this movement, then you surely have noticed it outside of any ostracism there has been. I can pull up many incidents and platitudes that have been by numerous of this movement. So I guess he's saying there was apocalyptic fever. Um, and Patrick Rampey has uh, an expression. He says he still has apocalyptic fever. I think studying Daniel Revelation kind of does that to people. So uh, Patrick is saying, you know, we obviously need to recognize that Christ is coming back. Um, so then he goes on to say, my point, though, is extra pressure that is unintended by the texts or the ramifications of the message. Human interpretation and application of scripture being the main culprit for divergent commands that float around. An easy example, you can't do anything else because Nashville is being bombed, etc. So he's just saying that we had all this panic about Nashville. Now, one of the things that, that he's doing here in his communication that I think we always need to be careful about is he's using highly emotionally charged language. That is, he's using rhetoric. Um, and I always try to be as free of rhetoric as I can when I communicate. So using something like culprit. Now it could be English isn't his first language, and these are just the words that comes to his mind. Um, English but, is not his first language. Yeah, yeah, well, I know. So, so it could be just the first words that come to his mind, but even something like saying the Nashville blunder, you know, it could be just, but those are, 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 are not great words to use. They have connotation. But sometimes people use language that is, it's meant to, to lead a person to think a certain way. Uh, you see this always in politics. And, and our language should be free of those types of things. Um, so Patrick Crampy makes some comments, and then I have some comments. I think you need to use simpler language so that I can understand what you were saying. Because one is when he tries to use bigger language, it becomes more complicated uh, as far as translating it, but that's just my view is talk more simply, more plainly. Um, so I'm saying that La Nashville is not a blunder. Uh, it was, you're saying that it was a foolish mistake rather than the Lord's explicit leading as something I cannot accept. 
So he goes on to say, I understand, sir, this movement was raised up with unique and novel methodology. Now, I'm not sure what he means, a unique and novel methodology. I don't think our, our methodology is novel. I don't think it's new. And I don't think it's unique. I think it's the same methodology as the Millerites. Everyone understands that the way that one studies is always predictor of correctness of truthfulness of study. Scripture is understood according to its obvious meaning and observes laws that govern scripture. A wayfaring man uh, cannot um, be a Marian if Will you tell us what is going on in tonight? Why God to make the stars and moon for tonight? Uh, I'm not going to do that. Thank you so to us. Now, I'm not going to do that tonight, Mark. Why maybe, not? Maybe at the end. Maybe at the end I can just show you on the, uh, the uh, astronomy program. At the end of the study, I'll do that. Okay? Okay, Mark? Yes, sir. Okay. So... He said, scripture is understood according to its obvious meaning, and it observes laws that govern scripture. The wayfaring man cannot err therein if he uses the correct methodology. Now, I'm not really sure if that's true. I think that people can, can, make, they can make mistakes even if they're using the correct methodology. The Millerites made mistakes. We don't argue that they made mistakes because their methodology was wrong. They made mistakes because only certain things can be understood at certain times. And so there's limitations, human limitations to understanding truth. And so we're not going to understand everything uh, until we need to understand it. Um, so he, he makes this argument, did Nashville, Tennessee happen? The answer is no. So maybe we need to re-examine our presuppositions that made us arrive to such conclusions. The job of the dirt brush man is to sweep away error. It is common knowledge in this movement that the precious jewelry of truth is always hid under a mass of human maxims and traditions. The truth always shows as clear as, as noonday. Therefore, the tools used in predicting Nashville were incorrect. And even as I type today, nothing in the tune of our prediction happened. Now, this is not logical. So, obviously, we know that the event did not occur but we have very good reasons why it didn't occur. And, and we should have known that it wouldn't occur, but there's no that way that we really could have known until after the fact. So we can see God's hand in it. Um, now he says, instead of playing the Lord's leading card. So again, that's not something I would use in discussing an issue. I wouldn't use that type of language. Um, I wouldn't characterize something because Instead of playing the Lord's leading card, he's implying that there is a trickery or deceit involved without saying it directly. Uh, I probe into the foundational logic. If the reality I am seeing is wrong, maybe my implicit and explicit presuppositions are wrong. Therefore, I might need to re-examine them. This is what all patriarchs used to do. If something they did was not working, they asked themselves, where, where were they wrong? And they corrected that. If you want to continue in your ways, Mr. Turner, who am I to stop you? But those of us who came for truth and understanding will ask for the Lord's mercy so that, that where we miss the mark in our method may be, uh, I'm not sure, panel beaten for error is never harmless. I'm not sure what he means there. Uh, it's probably some other word. But the point is, we can't judge God's word in the way that he's suggesting. If we followed this reasoning as we studied when we studied the Millerite, the disappointments of the Millerites, we could see that they were wrong on many occasions of what they were predicting, but they didn't then uh, continue on with the same ideas that they had before because they could see even in their disappointments that the Lord was leading. If they had taken this argument that what they predicted didn't happen they would have abandoned the movement long before. And in fact, many people did. Many people took the same uh, stance. They said, nothing happened. 
in the spring of 1843. Nothing happened in the fall of 1843. Nothing happened on December 31st, 1843 or January 1st, 1844. Um, and nothing happened on March 21st, 1844. And so those people who had believed that those events should uh, mark a fulfillment of prophecy and when they didn't, uh, decided to leave the message, they're doing exactly the same thing he is here. So, um, now he says, maybe I do not understand. I'm a student, I'm willing and committed to learning, which is a good stance to take. I will not pre pretend to be a pundit at Millerite history for I'm not, but regardless of that, Nashville did not happen with my scanty Millerite understanding. 2014 to me marks the end of the first temple cleansing and ushers in the second. Um, so what is he saying that 2014 marks the end of the first temple cleansing and ushers in the second? Would we argue that in the line of the priests? Uh, um, so it's the end of the first temple cleansing. So would 2014 mark the end of the first temple cleansing first off? My, my first question would be, where biblically would we address the first temple cleansing and where would we address the second temple cleansing? Right. See, and that's, that's what I'm saying. So to me, first off, this is kind of a scattered, like he's not giving me any information to understand how he thinks of this line. He throws in these temple cleansings in, in 2014. But from a biblical point of view, what is the first temple cleansing? Well, if he's, if he's referring to the temple cleansing that the Savior did at the outset of his ministry, right? then the second temple cleansing is the one that he did at the close of his ministry, right before the crucifixion. Right. So if, if those are the cases, and he's trying to draw a line to this right now, is he then saying that the priest's temple is to be cleansed and now that it's gone on to the second temple cleansing that they're being prepared to be lifted up as as a crucifixion that would be the logic that that i would have to ask right now but that but that's still the main point is when we apply the first and temple cleansing in the time of christ we can't just keep applying it in our line everywhere for every single group, right? What I'm saying is that we need to be very clear on our lines. We need to know who the temple cleansing is referring to uh, because in, in the time of Christ, the temple there was, uh, you know, the second temple and he's doing it symbolically. So we, we'd first have to go through and understand why he's cleansing the temple, which I don't think, I mean, we can just talk about the temple cleansing, but I think we need to know what it means. And then we have to decide, well, who's it applied to in our line? Um, and, and which line are we talking about? Are we talking about the priests, the Levites? Are we talking about the big line? Are we talking about, you know, what are we talking about with this temple cleansing? Now, I understand that this has been applied by Jeff in various ways at different times. Um, and, and, and so I understand the confusion, but I don't think it's something that we, we can even bring in in talking about this issue. So trying to talk to about 2014 and bringing it in as a temple cleansing, you know, maybe it, it could apply in some way, but he's not telling me what it is he's doing and why he's making this argument. But then he's going to say my logic. So he's going to use 1989 minus 1863 is 126. So in 1863, James introduces a, a chart. It's not a chat. They didn't have chats back then. Based on the first of the three steps in abandoning of the way of truth, Conclusion of the history, Jeff introduces lines of first in the three steps that takes us back to Millerite logic, start and end. So what he's simply saying here is that um, we have this 126 years and uh, we can go from 1888 to 2014 and we can go from 
1863 to 2014. Um, so he says this means something, obviously, but what exactly? In the first 126 for this movement, you can follow what is happening easily. I just want to understand why the 151 and the 126 take us to 2014. Just a logical explanation for it, as we see with the first 126 that was discovered in this movement. That will be all for now. So what he's doing here is he's presenting, I want to understand this. And, and that's definitely a good position to take, right? So he presents why he thinks something is logical. And now he's suggesting the 2014 has to do with the temp temple cleansing. And, and he's going to use this idea that there's three steps. Um, now we know three steps. Uh, we can look at these in different ways, but we know that the gospel is a three-step testing prophetic message that develops and um, um, there's the other word, two classes of worshipers. Uh, uh, so manifests and divides two classes of worshipers. It demonstrates develops and demonstrates two classes of worshipers. Um, so obviously that does happen in 2014. Whether you want to connect it with the temple cleansing, I don't know if that's necessary. But he's already just given us a logic for 2014, which is the same explanation that I've had for 2014 ever since we introduced it back in the beginning. So to me, this, this is acceptable. Um, so he has a logical explanation, and, and I don't see why then his objection to begin with. Um, so it's, it's a little conversation he has with Patrick. Um, and some stuff about Donald Trump getting COVID-19. Uh, so I'm going to then respond to him. Um, did Nashville, Tennessee, so we, we're going to analyze how I address him. Is this actually appropriate? Um, did Nashville, Tennessee happen? The answer is no. So maybe we need to re-examine our presuppositions that made us arrive at such conclusions. That's his statement. And I say you use a false assumption. First, methodology can only reveal what God wants us to see. God's purposes are different than ours. His purpose is to recreate in man the image of Christ. Our disappointment was necessary to show us who we are, both individually and prophetically. And there's nothing wrong with our methodology. We have applied these rules consistently and obediently. Our conclusions were correct. We were clearly shown that the prediction would fail, though the very methodology that gave up through the very methodology that gave us the prediction. While the period of darkness began in 1957, it does not end in 1989. We are in a period of an increase in light. God has revealed all we were able to bear. If we want more light, we cannot deny the light behind us. If you believe July 18, 2020 was an error, you have rejected the light of the midnight cry and will go into darkness and fall off the path. I have no problem understanding 2014. I presented this again and again. We need to recognize that it is part of the structure of the prediction before midnight. I suggest you watch the various presentations on the Millerite disappointments. Until then, you are doing damage to people with your doubts. Your fancy language hides deceit. So I'm being pretty bold here. It might be a tool to persuade some, but it will not fool those who abide by the truth. So is this paragraph appropriate? So I want people to, to weigh in on this. Because um, so far, I, I've, I haven't been hard on him until this paragraph. Okay, so you're asking us if you're being too hard on him with what you said here? Yeah. <clears throat> okay. I don't think, you know, in your heart, I don't think you're trying to be hard on him. I think, not. I think that you are approaching it, trying to get him to word his comments in such a way that would make logical sense to us. Now, yes, he does not speak English as his primary language. Mm -hmm. He's trying, but yeah. he doesn't have it completely down. Right. So, I guess, you know, in, in this, you've made a statement. Mm -hmm. Until then, you are doing damage to people with your doubts. 
I would have phrased it as a question. Do you not see that you are causing damage mm -hmm. with people? Yeah. With, with the doubts that you're expressing. Right. And, and, and I, I think here I was a little bit frustrated with him. <laughs> no, it comes through very clearly. I mean, there, there's a level of sarcasm. Yeah, well, yeah, I wouldn't say I'm sarcastic, but it definitely, I, I'm trying to say, you need to communicate better. And, and you know, I, I, I'm almost saying he's lying, which isn't very nice. Okay, uh, Theodore. Yeah. Sometimes you have to, sometimes you have to meet a person um, on the ground that they are on. There comes a time sort of uh, to be a mirror to them, to reflect back what they are saying so a little bit of that might be helpful and the other thing about the language he, he is uh, he does have a doctorate in pharmacology so I don't think he's suffering in the area of English okay but dealing dealing as a, a pharmacologist brother is going to be a little bit different than dealing as someone that is working through these kind of questions as a biblical student what i was about what i, I was about I've, to I've, I've 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 had email exchanges with him for probably the last 6 years a little bit off and on uh, I don't see any problem with his understanding of the English language or the use of it. Well, he well, might try actually, to be a little Shakespearean sometimes, but you know that's typical of the African uh, continent. I find people there tend to speak more like uh, a Shakespeare play sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for the, those views. Okay. And and I think. I think that I could have been more um, by asking, I think your suggestion, asking it as a question. Don't you realize that it's possible in, in presenting these doubts that it affects people negatively or something like that? Um, Another way to put, put things when it's negative is uh, instead of saying you, say I. I think I I think you're doing this. I see. Is it possible that you're doing this? Have you considered yeah. that you may be doing this? Something like that. Yeah. And so that's another suggestion. Uh, now, you know, I, I, you know, as, as the discussion went on, you start to analyze, okay, how am I doing? Uh, you know, who is this person? What are they trying to say? My view was that he he was sort of trying to attack July 18th um, in an indirect way. So that, that was where I was trying to say, like, what you're doing is not as direct as I would be. I would be more direct about what my position is and try to state the arguments. So he's starting to say he's a simple person. The event didn't happen. So something's wrong about it. And now he talks about this numbering system. So. Now, maybe that's just the way he says it, but we didn't come about with the prediction with the numbering system. We used prophecy. So I, I ask him if he's watched the presentations, do you understand the various chiasms? Um, and are you going to apply this logic to October 22nd, 1844? Uh, you have rejected the light of the midnight dry. It should be cry. Be careful what you say. Um, and, and that's what I, what I believe is that when you reject July 18th, you're rejecting the light of the midnight cry because July 18th is just an unfolding of that light. And you know, once it's understood, and then he puts another option, if the intended result was not seen, then maybe the method employed was wrong. So of course, I don't believe that that's how you dis decide what a methodology is correct or not. So again, I keep asking him, are you applying this logic to October 22nd? So we're now going to go into this comparison between August 11th, 1840 and October 22nd. So I want to illustrate this a little bit. Uh, so I'm going to erase what I have on the board here.
and I need to switch to, I just got to do this for recording, I have to switch cameras. Otherwise, it will just record with the other camera. So I've done this before, but we know that when we parallel our line with um, Millerite history, 1798, August 11th, oh, August 11th, 1840. BC. No, this is not BC. This is AD. April 19th, 1844. Um, and we're going to go 1989, and we know that this is 9-11, and this is 9-11. And then we're going to have Midnight, Midnight Cry, and what we call the Sunday Law in, but I'll, I'll do it this, I'll just do October 22. So this is August 15th, and this is July 21st. Cows. So when we deal with 9-11, what's that? Somebody Cows. made a question. Okay. I will make. Okay. God make, not, but I heard from Levi and Joel, my nephews, saying, God make lights with the stars and, okay. and storm. He said to them, he and I swear to us. Okay, well, we'll, we'll talk about the stars uh, tonight later. Okay, so, so in looking at this, on, we can apply different lines here. Right, because once we get to 9-11, we can, this can be the close of probation, but it can also be the Sunday law. And so what we would do is we would uh, match this up different ways. So or I'll do the big line. Close of probation. Uh, this is the loud cry. And this is the Sunday law. Right. So this is the big line. Uh, the main point here uh, in addressing... I'm trying to remember what I was doing. <laughs> um, in the question that he brought up was, um, right, okay, now I remember. Sorry about that. <clears throat> so the issue has to do with um, August 11th is He's trying to say that July 18th is parallels August 11th. But we know that July 18th parallels 9-11. And if we're going to put uh, July 18th in here, we would go to Samuel Snow's letters, and his letters are going to begin before April 19th, and they're going to end three days before midnight on July 18th. And my argument is that Snow's letters are about July 18th. And if we put them into our line, into our history here, we know that, that we have a way mark that lines up with April 19th, that's 9-11. But we're going to take Snow's letters and we're gonna place them before the Sunday law, three days before, as a symbol. And this is July 18th. So this July 18th and this July 18th symbolize the same thing. Now, one of the issues that Jeff and I had with Snow's letters were that Snow's letters began before April 19th. But in our line, even though 9-11 is one way mark, we can separate it out and see it as two different way marks when we parallel it here. It's not two different points in time. That is, this is not uh, a different period of time because it's one event. But we can then say that after the nine, after August 11th in Millerite history, we can now then apply that. So we, in a sense, can put 
this is the priests, they begin after 9-11, which is here, but they begin before 9-11, which is April 19th, the first day of the first month. I'm going to put this here. The fifth day of the fourth month. The first day of the fifth month. And the tenth day of the seventh month. Okay. Now, this doesn't make sense to some people, but I'm just saying that the priests exist here typically in this July 18th prediction, and that we can compare parallel them with Snow's letters. Now, in this line of the priests, we can't mark this July 18th as August 11th, 1840. August 11th, 1840 is something that precedes this movement. 9-11 precedes this, this line of the priests here. Now, when I say this movement, we can say this movement goes all the way back here. But there's something, when we start to recognize the priests in this movement, we start to recognize that there's something special that happens in this movement that doesn't start in 1989, just like snow doesn't start in 1798. And, and this is an experience that this movement went through. Specifically, if we wanted to say something about it, we would say it's FFA. That is, FFA parallels Samuel Snow's letters, the history of FFA. And I've demonstrated this before. So he wants to say, that um, July 18th should line up here, but I'm lining it up with October 22nd. Now in doing so, you can see here that July 18th is not lined up with October 22nd. It's lined up with July 18th. But this is about a prediction about October 22nd, which is going to be a disappointment. And in Snow's letters, we are seeing that this movement here has to experience something that Snow experienced that relates to this disappointment here. And that's what happened with the priests. We went through an experience that was an increase of light that we can parallel with Samuel Snow's letters. But it contains a disappointment because this disappointment needed to be experienced by the priests so we could understand Millerite history. When we went through this disappointment, we then could understand more specifically who we are. That has been my argument all this time. One is that we didn't know who we are and that we need to find out who we are. Even before July 18th, I talked about the fact that we don't know who we are. After July 18th, we do. We understand clearly that we are snow and that we experienced this prediction that he made about October 22nd, we experienced it with July 18th. That is, his letters that were predicting October 22nd had this July 18th built into their structure. And that July 18th then had to be experienced by us so that we truly could say that we are snow. That's my argument. Now, of course, he doesn't know about this. At least I don't think he does because uh, it's fairly new in how this has been presented. And any thoughts on that? I know I presented this before, but... Uh... Yeah, you've presented this a few times. Yeah. Okay, so it's something that he's probably not aware of. And but he's talking about this numbering system. So I, I start to go after him a little bit. Are you gonna, I keep saying, are you gonna present, the, use the same logic for October 22nd? And, uh, and then he says, the point here is that either the numbering system is incorrect or the expected event was erroneous. And of course, that's a false dichotomy. You can't just say, you can't just plainly say that. Obviously, the methodology that we use the chronology can be correct and we can not have the expected event because the Millerites experienced that many times. And that's why if you take this logic to Millerite history, you would have to reject the light of the midnight cry. So I'm, I'm not sure what he means by the numbering system. And, and I say that because I think that many people believe that the date was derived at through numbers, but it wasn't derived at 
through numbers. It was derived at prophetically through prophecy. The numbers became a, a tool or a, an analysis. They became part of the, the way that we would examine our prediction, but they weren't the basis for, um, like none of the math was done to make this prediction in the way that, uh, that we later used to analyze it. And, and, and I think I've made that clear that a lot of people were using this analysis as, as how we derive the dates. And I, and I think that's wrong. And he, he provides another thing is C, maybe the commencement point to the chain of truth may not be true. And this is where I come in in this discussion. I do not think the commencement was correct nor the usage of the dates to get Nashville is correct. So I'm not sure what he means by the commencement point to the chain of truth because the commencement to the chain of truth that we're using here is that that has been established in Millerite history. Um, so to come to July 18th, 2020, uh, we actually didn't use 1863 or 19 or 1888. Uh, those weren't actually part of, of any of the prediction at all. So, you know, he's, he's addressing that. Um, now the question is, so here you start to see this, this discussion develop in a way that we start to, to show what it is we are doing, right? We're starting to show uh, what our, you know, for the way that he's doing, he's starting to show his, his, what, he's, what he's attacking, right? Because before this, he is not really clear and, and he's gonna try to make this an attack on the message. Okay, but he's, yeah. mixing, he's mixing metaphors here too. Because when, when he is going commencement point to the chain of truth, mm -hmm. that's, I mean, I'm, the, the place that I'm most comfortable with that being applied has always been on the 1843 chart. Right. So what, what he seems to be saying in this is he's viewing the chronological evidence that has been presented as either A, another commencement of the chain of truth, in other words, being the equal of the 1843 chart, or he's trying to say that it is a false commencement, but, but that would not make it a commencement of a chain of truth. Right. No, that's the thing. It, cause, and, and I try to say, well, if you're talking about July 27th, 1299, um, that would be the commencement of, of this whole prophecy dealing with July 18th, 2020. Um, so my argument is July 18th, 2020 is an unfolding of the light of the midnight cry. It's solid and cannot be undone. Um, and then I say again, why are you criticizing something you, you have no understanding of? So maybe that's a bit harsh again, but it just doesn't seem to me like he understands what it is he's, he's saying. What, I guess what I, what I was trying to say before yeah. is you're coming across very much as a, a university professor would with a, a first year student that really isn't giving a, a full explanation of their thought process. Right. That's the way that I'm trying to do it. I'm saying, look, I want you to explain to me where the error is. I want you to be clear what your arguments are because they're not clear to me. It's like as if he wrote a paper and I'm saying, I can't see that your your information makes sense, like your argument makes sense. Because to me, it doesn't. Now, again, it could be that he has some ideas behind it, but he hasn't made those really clear. Um, all, all, all I'm trying to say, Theodore, is um, season this with a little bit more brother and a little bit less professor. Okay. Yeah, and, and I tend to operate on professor mode, you know, a little bit didactic that way. But I'm... I do understand that, but in this case, yeah, yeah, okay. I, I, I agree with you. So now, 
Now he does some other things, so I'm, I'm criticizing a little bit the way he's talking about. Um, um, like I said, I'm I'm a simple person. I don't like when people <laughs> use that that stance, especially when you know he's not a simple person. <laughs> you know, um, so he he says, "Let's approach it with your alignment." It's true. I do not understand the message but it's not a shibboleth that can't be probed. Sister White says the following concerning August 11th. So now he's going to go through and deal with August 11th. And he's going to say that this is something that was solid. It empowered the message. Um, and then he says, as bad luck will have it, nothing happened to s happen, sir, for the merciless heckling of opponents to the work of Mr. Pippinger. So he says, basically, the problem with July 18th is nothing happened. But now people are heckling Jeff, and so it's done its damage, right? So, um, which I don't think is a fair statement. Um, so I, I keep saying that you're not applying the line consistently, and the PBM is July 18, 2020. This aligns with Snow's letters. You're using the method of Miller incorrectly. So I'm showing that he's not using this. And then I, I, I go into this thing where there's no such thing as luck. This is really beside the point. Um, but now I, I introduce this idea because he talks about bad luck. And I actually believe that God, uh, I don't believe in luck. I don't believe in misfortune. Um, I believe that God's providence guides us and that we shouldn't look at something as good luck or bad luck as, as a Christian. That as a Christian, the, the word luck really doesn't have any part in our language, but especially when we're dealing with something prophetic like this, you know, to say that it's bad luck, uh, you know, just is, that's not acceptable to me uh, for a Christian to ever use that when we're talking about something like this. Um, so uh, he said, he, he says, I said on one level, the level of proving the correctness of a system of numbers employed by getting to get to Nashville, Tennessee. And so uh, what happened on Nashville, Tennessee on the day you came up with? Number two, those who followed your ideas went on to give more dates after the passing of time. You keep turning a blind eye to the obvious fact that nothing did happen on July, which I, of course I don't. On October 22, something did happen. This was predicted on August 11th. Sister, Sister White did tell us correctly that even unbelievers saw that the numbering system developed by Mr. Miller and his associates was spot on. Um, so October 22nd, something happened, but not as far as anyone could see. The thing about October 22nd is that it's happened in heaven and our understanding of it is based upon faith of understanding the lines. That is the timelines that God gave us the system of truth and everything that we have done is connected exactly with that same system of truth. It's not something new. It's not some new argument. Um, so anyway, I go on a little bit uh, dealing with that luck thing. And, and I talk about how uh, Rafi and Paniam are still future. So we're going to deal with this here. Um, so I'm skipping some things. He talks about the two streams. So here's where it gets, you know, and I don't know how much I contributed to this. Now, this is again, Muku, uh, Muku Prime. Uh, the two streams, like you said, there's nothing such as misfortune. Like, seriously, what does that even mean? Uh, now you have spun a new theory to say those who identified correctly that nothing happened in Nashville do not understand the message and should understand it as you. Nothing, zero zilch happened. Reminds me of parminderism where no one accepts their error. We were forced by pulpit proxy to say there was a Sunday law in 2014 as he had a strong conviction in his method. So when we start to compare a person to another person that has been discredited in some way, uh, this is, oh, it's two different things. It's, um, an ad hominem attack, but it's also muddying the waters um, because there's really nothing similar about what Parminder has done and, and what I have done. So 
definitely nowhere did I use any sort of power uh, to manipulate people or force people to accept anything. And I don't think Jeff did either. I don't think, think Jeff uh, used power to try to say that July 18th is, is correct. He didn't manipulate people. He didn't use force. Um, so it, it's quite a different story. Um, but also the thing of nothing, zero, zilch really isn't nice language. I, I wouldn't use that myself personally. Uh, it's a little bit hard. Now he says he's read a lot of my works on academia and I knew the litmus test was time as time would have nothing as time would have it, nothing happened. So in here, he's showing, first off, he was going to test the event. If the event occurred, then it would be correct. If the event didn't occur, then an argument was faulty. And I never took that position. And neither did Jeff. Jeff says, if nothing happens on July 18th, 2020, uh, it doesn't mean we were wrong. That sort of position excludes faith, because if we take that position on the second coming of Christ, it'll be too late. Oh, you mean if he's going to use that, we're going to wait to see if Jesus comes back? You're talking about? Right, like a typical atheist position. I don't believe in God, but if he shows himself, I'll believe him. Right. Now, for me, as everybody knows, who's talk to me and see my presentations. To me, the lines that were being unfolded were an amazing miracle. And, and I knew that even if the event didn't occur, that we had already witnessed a miracle. But I was still convinced that the, the event would occur because it just seemed unreasonable for God to have so much evidence for something and it not to occur. But I realized that it, it was possible it wouldn't occur. I made that really clear. Excuse me, please. Yeah. Um, I am sorry I am being rude. I am here here this this guy saying we don't know when is Christ to come. He will to tell us when he is ready to come. Second time. Yeah, well, it's, yeah. The one, one small thing. Okay. He tell us when he is ready to come second time is he will bring the end of this earth with him. Yeah. Um, second time, they is not good at what there. Yeah. You do come pick me up at more than I other have not come back. Mm -hmm. He repaired us. Second time, he come back pick, pick up other half, get ready for third time. Is a big kick last fight. Okay. Thanks, Mark. Okay, so I I come back to this point and which I think ties into to this whole this whole issue about bad luck. So bad luck, misfortune, etc., are all words that attribute events to random processes and not to God's overseeing providence. I do not use those words. They have no place in the vocabulary of a, a Christian. You are the one who is using false logic. I simply have studied the prof prophecies of Scripture. God in his providence gave us July 18, 2020. It has been explained. Its purpose is clear. You stand in opposition to God with your empty criticisms. If it is error, can you show me where the error lies? The time was correct. I do not understand. You do not understand the message. By show me the error, I'm asking you to show me how we incorrectly arrived at July 18, 2020. I find no error in the reckoning of the prophetic periods. Every element is precise and exact. As well, God has clearly shown his purposes. There is no mystery to be solved. We know our duty. We know where we are in history. 
we have a responsibility to fulfill. I do not understand how you cannot see this. So he's going to again go back to one of his arguments. He's going to deal with these lines, 25, 20, 12, 60, 151, 26. There, was there randomness in the selection of the period or was there a method to it? Now, this really has nothing to do with July 18th. And that's where I, I find a problem in his thinking. That July 18th wasn't connected to the 151 or the 126. Um, so I'm going to just skip some of this stuff because I've explained it. Uh, so he says, English is my second language. But what is Ellen White referring to when she says multitude were convinced of the correctness of Mr. Miller and his associates? Something happened that gave impetus to the message. Forget the forced mating of July 18 and October 22. October 22 is a product of August 11th. Um, which I would argue that July 18th is a progress, uh, uh, a product of 9-11. I mean, there's the same type of relationship. Um, so anyway, in trying to go through, I'm not going to go through every single thing that we discuss. Um, but I'm going to read what he says here. He says, at 9-11, there was no prediction in its relation to time. Predictions came at the crossing place of the first temple cleansing and the second temple cleansing. Um, so I'm not sure what he marks as the second temple cleansing. Uh, the first prediction predicted predicated on time, came after the second way mark in our history. I think he might say that the second temple cleansing was on November 9th, 2019, and the first temple cleansing ended in 2014. I think that's what he's arguing. Um, but it had to be tested as it was tested in Millerite history, and it was measured and found wanting, truly a meanie meanie tickle you farson. Uh, so the ideas you are harboring that try to emphasize a covenant between July 18 and October 22, and a great gulf between July 18 and August 11th. There are multiple problems with this logic. One, it makes October 22 a mutually exclusive event with no race relationship whatsoever to August 11th. This is a great blunder. So can somebody try to explain what he's trying to say here and what his position is? Does anybody see because it doesn't really make sense based on what I've told him and what he said earlier. How is he connecting these, these two? Uh, anybody see what he's saying? I'm not catching his point. Okay, because I'm not catching it. So, uh, I mean, the only thing I can see that he, he doesn't like that I put July 18th as a parallel to October 22nd. Um, but in, in, in me doing that, he thinks I'm divorcing July 18th uh, from August 11th. And I'm not. I'm just saying that August 11th is 9-11. That's the parallel. I, I don't know that I can make that kind of a leap, but he does, you know, he seems to take a lot of, of grief of having October 22nd parallel to July 18th. Right. Yeah, so he doesn't like that. And, and I would think the reason he doesn't like it, because if you take that position that I've taken, it explains July 18th. Um, now, Aaron says, October 22nd, 1844 was the 187th day. So that's one way in which we already have connected the 10th, uh, July 18th, the 18th day of the seventh month with October 22nd. So we, we had all kinds of symbols in the line showing us that July 18th is connected to October 22nd. Uh, even when we, we added up the first day of the first month, the fifth day of the fourth month, the first day of the fifth month, and the 10th day of the seventh month, and they added up to 187. Uh, that is a strong indication that that whole, uh, that whole line is about July 18th. And that what we experienced then as priests is typifying in time what's going to happen in something that is not connected with predicted time. That is, we can't predict the close of probation. We can't predict the time of the Sunday law. 
but we had time in our line in a way that it affirmed that this movement uh, was of God. And it wasn't the event being fulfilled that gave us that affirmation. It was the time itself, the lines themselves, that showed us this structure in a symbolic fashion internally within this movement. And this is the thing that should be held on to people in this movement, is to recognize that we were given something as, as an anchor to, to hold on to, to go through the time ahead. And, and it bothers me, I guess, when I see people arguing against it, but not apparently understanding what it is they're saying. Um, I'm not arguing. No, you're not arguing. This is a guy from Africa who's arguing. Um, right, and he talks about harboring. I say, I'm harboring no ideas. These are truths plainly showed us over the past seven years. And how am I making October 22nd, 1840 a mutually exclusive event? There's nothing in anything I have said that even implies that. There's nothing in what you have said that even shows that I have implied that. Address where you find the error in how I arrived at July 18, 2020. Do not address imagined ideas that I've never held. So he's going to start to try to deal with some of the errors. Error number one, forced mating of July 18 and October 22. So that's not really anything to do with how I came to July 18th, right? So that wasn't part of the argument for July 18th. It's not part of the math. Error number we three. don't know when it is happened. Yeah. He is wrong. Yeah, we don't know when Jesus is coming back. Error number two, insisting that there was a prophecy that was fulfilled on your date. Well, I'm not sure that I insist that there was a prophecy fulfilled. I'm, I've always argued that it's the lines themselves, the structure, uh, that is significant, not the events that we mark in this structure. Now, we have some events that are fulfilled that gave us the structure to begin with, but just because events didn't occur doesn't mean that the structure is wrong. So I, I, I don't actually insist that there's some prophecy that was fulfilled. So that... Error number two, idea is wrong. Error number three, you distance October 22 from August 11. Uh, and of course, I don't. So actually, in, in the whole thing, I, I connect them. And number four, because you deny these errors, you think you can escape the prison you created for yourself. So here, our language starts to become, you know, my language is a little bit harsh. His is maybe a little harsher. Um, actually don't feel like I'm in any kind of prison. So, um, and I don't deny any error. It's just that he's not actually presenting any errors that we use, uh, that we made. Um, he... Hey, Mark, we'll, we'll talk later. I'm, I'm yeah, dealing with... I say he is not connect with this, this Lord, I am all time. Yeah, well, that could be true, but it's a harsh thing to say about someone. Um, so he says, what you fail to understand, Snow's letters on one level follow the everlasting gospel. So it would be nice if he illustrated what he means by this. But actually, I take the position that they do follow the everlasting gospel. Um, Snow's letters are extremely important in that they demonstrate the chiasm with the cross in the center. And, and so I think I've made this really clear that, they're, that Snow's letter are the everlasting gospel. So I'm not sure why he says you fail to understand. And if that is understood, anything that follows the everlasting gospel is subject to Pippinger's rules of line construction, which is true. Again, I would argue that that's correct. So if you became a false lich, on the eve of July 18th, whether you accept it or, or are cognizant of it, those are the facts. So, so he's still trying to say that July 18th must parallel August 11th, 1840. But if he's dealing with line construction, just as I showed on the board, we can't place July 18th. It's not part of the first angel's message. It's not an empowerment of the first angel's message. It can't be a parallel to August 11th, 1840. So it, and, and since we are snow and Ezekiel, 
since they're typified by them, Snow and Ezekiel are both dependent upon the 391 and a half. So Snow is dependent upon what Lich did. Ezekiel is dependent upon the, the prophecy of Josiah. Snow is de dependent upon the prophecy of Josiah Lich. So there's no way that you could say that our July 18th prediction is Lich. So that would be an argument against what he's trying to say. Um, we have known enzyme logic in this movement, the opening of this reform line, this was all a well-taught subject, and we know correctly when that when the correct prediction comes, there will be a true lifting up of the enzyme. Now, I think that this is an error that we made. So this is one of the things that I argue against, is that we were looking for a vindication of this movement that we believe that that was what was going to lift up us up as an enzyme. And my argument is that's false. What lifts us up as an enzyme, enzyme is us reflecting the character of Christ. And we definitely don't do that. Uh, if July 18th had occurred, we would not be prepared to be lifted up as an enzyme. We do not have the character of Christ so that the world would look upon us and see Christ's character perfectly reproduced in us, that he would see his glory upon us. And so, amen. And I just want to interrupt with an amen because that's exactly <laughs> my thoughts. When uh, July 18 was approaching, I'm like, I believe it, but it, um, I will be lost because well, uh, I, I don't see the Christ likeness. But then again, that's something that maybe we just don't see ourselves. Well, yes. Oh, I did. Okay. I did. I know where heaven is. Yes. And I am connect with him all time and study. I am Sam. Yes. And I, I, I talk to him. I see him uh, um, other, um, other day uh, in a Zumba. I saw his face. Okay. Um, now he says here, he's using, he's going to go to Miller's rules here. And he says, if one word lacks fulfillment, a systematic error, figures understood error, history and prophecy agree, error. So he's saying that uh, there's an error because we didn't have this one word didn't fit. Now, of course, this is not what, how Miller applied this rule. He was talking about the interpretation of the prophecy. So we have nothing where I could find a flaw with the July 18, 2020 prediction. We didn't have things that partially fit. Everything fit in the most remarkable way. But that the event didn't occur, even when October 22nd, 1844 didn't occur in the way that they expected, it doesn't mean their methodology was wrong. So again, he's applying this incorrectly. Now he's saying we need to apply it to, Ju to August 11th. July 18th is August 11th. But again, the lines don't show that. July 18th is snow. Snow's long after all August 11th. He's not lich. And this movement is not lich, at least not in this time. It was originally. You could argue that, that Jeff was fulfilling to some degree that role. Um, in, in what he was doing with line upon line. But, but I wouldn't even try to say that a person needs to be doing it. It's the movement that's fulfilling these various roles. But in the July 18th prediction, we're not glitch, we're snow. So um, it just doesn't fall. Um, so he's saying you and part are actuated by a different kind of spirit. You keep adding sin to sin. So he's saying that this is what I'm doing. I'm adding sin to sin, just like Parminder. You don't have the decency to clean up your own mess. Um, now, of course, this is kind of obviously not true, uh, but everything that I've done prior to July 18th was to be objective, 
to be fair, to look at all of the evidence and try to see if there was a fault with it. And then even after July 18th, we studied. So I've spent the last couple of months uh, going through all kinds of material to try to understand why this event didn't occur and what it means to us. So I don't think it's true that I don't have the de decency to clean up my own mess. But also, I don't think it's my mess. Uh, I wouldn't take the credit for it because uh, I didn't promote July 18th, except that the movement did. You know, I initially presented it to Jeff and I presented it because Jeff was presenting it. But once it was shut down, I wasn't presenting it, you know, in any kind of public way. I did have the July 18, 2020 website, so somebody could argue, or the Facebook page, so they could say I was arguing, but it was a study group that wanted to study and understand this. And so there was only a few people in that group. Um, so he says, you keep inventing theories to make July 18 a fulfillment of prophecy, and you now brand anyone who does not see significance of what happened in the same vein as you, as the one of, in need of understanding the message. So again, this is just not true. So they're going to go through. Some people say I'm, he's being pretty hard on me. Um, and a few other people. And then uh, Peter White comes in. Um, I think it's him. Um, yeah, so two different intentions. He says that uh, Parmenter came in with an agenda, and that's not so with Brother Turner. So that's kind of a nice thing to say. Obviously, I don't have an agenda. Um, and then he, he, he answers him, I don't think you know what you're talking about. The system that continues inventing theories in a bid to cover up a blunder is a system that is driven by parminderism. He is never wrong. Likewise, that same spirit finds homage among us. And then some other people comment on different things. Um, so um, just, he is wrong, that one. Yeah, okay. And God, God you make that will be heaven in you connect with him. Mm -hmm. So somebody else comes in. I'm not going to read theirs because um, I'm going to try to close this up here. Oh, Thomas Blake. This is another guy who comes in. This is the guy I was thinking of. Um, so this is somebody I've, I don't know who he is, if that's his real name. Um, uh, So he, he seems to be somewhat negative towards me. I'm not sure why. And, and then he talks about how that uh, Jeff had promised the Canadian brother that we would apologize on July 19th. And he says that's what was stated in the interview. So if you go to that Canadian brother, the Muslim cleric, and you, you search up apologize in... Uh, in the, the transcript, you'll see that it is mentioned that he asked Jeff if he would apologize. And Jeff doesn't say he would apologize. Um, he says when he's been wrong in the past, he has apologized. But he doesn't promise that he's going to apologize on July 18th if nothing happens. Um, so this is kind of misleading. But also I wrote the Canadian brother and he says there's no need for an apology. He knew that we were going to be wrong anyway. So, um, so um, you know, it's kind of a, a non-issue. Um, so then I deal with some of that stuff, and then I'm going to talk about this. So, so that's the end of, of that. Now, is there any questions regarding this? Um. The second line, no, I would tell when is the Lord is to come, second time. No, so we're not, we don't have a line that tells us when Christ is going to come. But what we do know is that just before he comes, the Father will announce the day and hour of his coming. But that will be by the voice of God after the seventh plague, or after the sixth plague, I guess, 
uh, prior to the seventh plague. Uh, so, when? I don't know when. We all have to find out when that is. Uh, when is the second plague? Uh, when is second, the sixth plague is done? And when Sam talk to him, I have more of questions. Yes. You answer. He yes. gave right answers back. Yeah, well, we'll have to wait and see, I guess. Yeah. Uh, I know you get impatient, don't you? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, but, um, okay. well, his friend did, she says, ask uh, Twitter to text his buddy. I want to text the, that, uh, that's cause on his buddy. I want to be a believer. Okay. Yeah. Now I want to go uh, and look at what Mark was talking about. So a lot of people know that there's a full moon and it's just, this is sort of beside the point just before we close with prayer. Uh, I just wanted to point out that uh, for the Jews, when they determine when the, um, when the full moon is, it's at sunset. Now I'm just going to have to get this set up here to show you what the sky looks like and um, who do you show what kind of stars he sent to me uh, tonight well I'm just gonna look at the moon and the sun here yeah so, um, now uh, So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at Edmonton here and I'm going to look in the east. So the sun rises in the east and here is the, stellar, still, the Stellarium program. So you should be able to see this here and you'll see that the moon has, this is in Edmonton, so we, we just had uh, the moon rise a while ago and I'm just going to go back in time which I can do easily with this program. And I'm just going to have the moon descend. So you'll see that the moon's going backwards. This is, and, and notice how Mars is right next to the moon right now. Um, two, two weeks ago, we saw Mars in the sky. Uh, the Mars is basically in opposition with the sun right now. Uh, so that means it's on the same, it's in line with the earth. And right now the earth, the moon and Mars are basically aligned, which is interesting. Now, that's in the east. You see that the moon is going to set. And over here in the west, uh, the sun is going to, uh, to set. So I have to uh, stop this. Okay, let me go a bit faster. Oops. I went way ahead there. Oh, which date am I on? Okay, let's go to the current time. Okay, so I'm gonna have to go back. Well, the sun set a while ago. So here we're gonna see, so this is the sunset here in in Edmonton. I'm just going to bring it up a little higher. So there you see the sun that's that's it looks like it's rising but this is just because I'm playing it backwards. So now I'm going to have the sun set and just as the sun sets there's sunset. Right there, right there. Yeah when I go into the east the moon has not yet arisen. And so 
when on the day of the full moon, you'll see that the moon will arise after the sunset. And there you're going to see the moon arising. Now, if I go back a day, so I'm going to go back a day. Um, I'm going to have to go back a bit farther. Could you show at, uh, could you show at three o'clock? Okay, so I'm going to have the, the day before, you see the moon has arisen um, and the sun is just setting. So uh, it's kind of hard to tell here. Now this is, this is here, of course, in Edmonton. Now you're going to see it's different in different places. So I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but what we can see now is that the sun, um, that the moon has arisen after the sun has set, and that marks the day of the full moon. So anyway, I, I probably could have it set up better, and I, and I probably should go to Jerusalem rather than Edmonton. Uh, but that's how they would determine the day of the full moon. So I'm going to stop to share there. We're going to close with prayer if, if there's not any final comments. Um, and, then, and then, Mark, I can you, talk with you still. I can still talk with you, Mark. I can answer some of your questions. What's that? Who has a question? Before we close with prayer. As far as... Um, um, through, through a discussion I like that. I have a question. Okay, I'll ask you. Okay, what's your question? Quest. After the class? Yes. Okay. Uh, we do prayer for the nurses and all of us for this of nineteen. Oh, you want to pray for the nurses and everybody about COVID-19? Yes. And did you hear that Trump is sick? And what? Yeah, Trump has, has uh, COVID-19 and so does his wife. I don't I know that. Yeah, that's the case. Okay, well, let's, let's close with prayer. We do a prayer for them. Yes. We do pray for, for this. For is go away. Yeah, okay. Dear Father in heaven, we are thankful for the Sabbath, uh, the Sabbath hours, the time that we can spend with you. And Lord, I pray that you can give us wisdom as we looked at how I communicated um, with uh, this brother from Africa. And Lord, I ask that you can give us wisdom in how we communicate especially in a public forum like that, even individually, when we're trying to uh, express truth to a person, help us to do it in a way uh, that does not put a person in the defensive. And Lord, we're, we're thankful for each person in this study. We know that we have much to learn. We have a character to develop. And we just ask that you can do this in us. And we pray for the situation that frustrates us so much, uh, this pandemic and, and we pray for those that are affected by this disease that includes Trump and his wife and others those that may be suffering and those that have lost family but we also know Lord that um, the hand of the state is pressing heavily upon us and that this is a type of the Sunday law and help us Lord to uh, to know what our role and responsibility is as we we address these things around us that discourage us, um, give us wisdom, make us understand clearly what is truth, help us to discern truth from error with all the rumors that go around, and, and help us to, to focus upon your word and the things that you are teaching us. And we thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.